Hi, and welcome back. I'm Terry Burns, and this is a continuation of my class on the Monus Hieroglyphia, Hieroglyphica, or Hieroglyphic Monad of Dr. John Dee. We're right in the middle of our class on Dee's letter to King Maximilian, which precedes his letter to the printer, and then the 24 theorems, which are what most people have focused on. I want to apologize for the length of this class on the letter to King Maximilian. There is a uh, difficulty in that many of the translations do not translate this letter, and it's a very dense letter, but say Hamilton Jones's translation doesn't have the letter of all. Um, the other translation available easily in English now is a very poor translation by someone who admits he doesn't know Latin, so it misses more than half of the things I'm talking about here. Um, although it, what he does with the theorems is, is pretty awesome. And um, Yaston's 1964 scholarly translation is in Ambix, but it's not available to a lot of you. So I'm including the text of the letter from the translation Dr. Turner and I did um, and that makes these videos a lot longer. But let's go ahead and get started. So, like I said, this is my class on the Hieroglyphic Monad. Welcome, and this is part three of class three on Dee's letter to Maximilian. Here's the frontispiece of the Monad, um, and as you can see, it's dedicated to the most wise Maximilian, king of the Romans of Bohemia and of Hungary. Six months later, Maximilian will be the Holy Roman Emperor. His great-grandfather, also Maximilian, was a great patron of people like um, Agrippa, Pico de Mirandola, um, Albert Dürer. And so D is appealing to this rulership of uh, uh, a family line that he feels will be very sympathetic to his project. Where we left off, in our last discussion of Dee's letter was we went through and explicated the second part of the letter. And in that section, he talks about what he means by a sacred language, which he considers the sacred languages Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, because they are the languages of creation, that um, the shapes of the letters create the world, and they contain great mysteries, according to Dee. They're all made by parts of a point lines and circles. A point, line, and circle are the first three things you will see when we get to his theorems in a bit. Um, so because of that, he has merged this geometric cosmogony of Plato's Timaeus with the creation by letters that uh, is in um, the Sefer Yetzirah, and also implicitly the creation of light. And when we get to the theorems, it won't be implicit at all. It will be explicit. The fiat lux of Latin in the Latin Vulgate Bible. So D in that previous section discusses how the letters themselves rise up to an apex, implying both the Gnostic ascent to the one, but also the apex of a cone of light. It is one of his absolute favorite, favorite, favorite images. He has diagrams on this in his other book of theorems, the uh, Propoidomata Aphoristica, which has a whole long um, group of theorems on what we would call conic sections. So let's look at the structure of what we're going to talk about in this part of the letter. On the surface, the structure here is much easier. D is going to go through a parade of professions who can benefit from exposure to his monad glyph. They're going to include grammarians, but like I said in the last class, his grammar is not what we consider grammar today. His grammar is how sacred letters and geometric points, lines, and circles create everything. Mathematicians, musicians, crystal gazers, Kabbalists, and physicians, among others, how each of them benefit from the monad. But underneath that list of 14 is going to be some of the most dense prose he writes. Um, I'll explain it to you. It's easier to, it's easy to understand when it's been explained, but like a lot, like a lot of things, it's pretty opaque if you don't have um, an idea of how to get into it. So when he discusses Kabbalists, he's going to introduce his ideas of real versus spoken Kabbalah. Athanasius uh, Kircher will directly allude to this. Um, there's a separate video on that below. He'll introduce his notion of a gamea, a type of magical seal. There's a video on that below. And he alludes to the Voarchidemia of Panteo. That allusion and the Voarchidemia itself, there are links to below. 
I'm going to talk about them briefly here, but I wanted to, to break each of them out because they're all important ideas. And for those of you interested in his Enochian corpus, the Gamea also links to something else. There's a video too below, his concept of an elementata, which is how you wind up getting things like fire of air, air of air, that kind of thing in say the great table of earth, which he and Kelly come up with two decades later. Okay, so remember that we're trying to understand D in the context of his time. So I'm trying to put my personal beliefs um, outside of this video. This isn't a Sunday school class. Your spiritual and, and alphabetic and geometric beliefs are your own, but you have to understand his references and he refers to the Bible a lot. Um, his plays on things that are part of Latin or Greek grammar, same thing. I'm explaining them because you don't under, you can't really understand the section if you don't. Also his references to various alchemical and philosophical texts. And so that's why I have several videos on word plays in this section in particular, because like I said, it's a very dense section. But the surface structure begins here with his parade of professions. Let's get started. D says, having Sent forth in this way, philosophers of letters and language, I bring out my own mathematicians to sincerely witness our rarity. And the arithmetician, I did not say logician, he who treats his numbers as abstracted from corporeality and all of sensibility freed, hoarded away in recesses and subjected to various mental actions in a dianoia, will he not marvel to see how in our work his numbers are shown and indeed become like something concrete and corporeal, the same having souls and forms apart from our practice. This word here, a dianoia, is, it's a, a rhetorical trope. It's a type of argument where you ask a question and answer. It's from a Greek word that literally means a revolving of the mind. There are a couple wonderful um, scholarly books out today and, and uh, one popular book also talking about how arithmetic in Dee's time and before was a sacred profession. Um, it's not the one plus one equals two of grade school. And the reason it's a sacred profession, you can sort of extrude from what he says here. It's because the idea is that the numbers are abstracted from this physical world. And so they are, uh, they are pure in a certain way, not unlike a platonic form is. So he continues and says, uh, this mathematician, will he not be astonished to see such great offspring from our monad to which no other monad or number could be added or used extrinsically to multiply? Now, why does he say other monad or number, isn't the monad one? No, it's not. And so let me go through this quickly. He has, as I mentioned in my last video, he's gone to great pains to not write the number one as an Arabic numeral, or he doesn't want you to think of it as an integer. It's the, supposed to be the one everything has come from and can return to. So that's important in this section because when he writes one in the margin of this list of 14, he doesn't write the numeral one. He actually writes an, a, a big I like a Roman numeral one. And that's gonna be the first of a series of 14. On this next slide, I did snip a little from uh, this uh, translation, not enough to violate copyright, but I want you to, to see how this would be in the layout. You see how one is a Roman numeral one, then he shifts to Arabic numerals after that. So this one is the arithmetician. The idea of arithmetic is sacred. Then what is two going to correspond to? Two will correspond to the monad. Three will correspond to one thing. So he has this trinity starting out before he gets to the professions. Um, and then he will go on with a, um, four as a musician, five as an astronomer, and so on as we go through them. There will be one other little blip in this, but I'll talk about it when we get there. So D continues and says, will he, the mathematician, arithmetician, 
Will he not be astonished to see such great offspring from our monad, to which no other monad or number, they're different things, could be added or used extrinsically to multiply? Then he's going to go on in three when he talks about the one thing, and he's going to use some language that is a bit conspicuous. Let me explain after I read this. D says, will not his admiration have been most influenced by that subtlest general rule of evaluating things, whereby the intrinsic value of one thing, right, spelled out and in caps, small caps, designated by some, not D, as a void, is put forth, so as to resolve any arithmetic doubt and itself is assessed as a thing containing 10 by examination, accurate division, and equations, and as that art will have it prior meditation. In Latin, he's conspicuously using the word denario, which means groupings of 10. It doesn't mean the number of 10. We've translated it as decad, which is what most people do. But he draws attention also to the fact that he's using denario by, in the Latin, surrounding it with these words that sound like, or they poetically play off the Latin word centum, the numeral 10. So he will use census, sensum. They poetically play off centum, the word he doesn't use. He uses denario. The thing containing 10, of course, you may know already. It's that both the decad and the Pythagorean tractus shown here below. That is often seen as a lower level monad. That is all 10 of these go up and merge with the apex of this. And that itself contains a higher order decad and so on. So at the same time, this grouping of 10, you can add up one, two, three, four, add up to 10 each way, and there's 10 dots. So the tectractus is a, a really important Pythagorean concept. Let's go on. D then says, the geometer, my king, will have begun to hesitate for the principles of his art will have seemed insufficiently established. That itself being strange, when he grasps what is here, in secret, murmured and hinted at, that in the place of the square mystery of our hieroglyphic monad, something circular and wholly equal is discovered. Pause. Read that again and see if you can figure out what he's talking about. If you've stayed with me this far, you probably can. The square mystery of our hieroglyphic monad, something circular and wholly equal is delivered. I'm going to continue this on the next screen. The square mystery of our hieroglyphic monad, something circular and wholly equal is delivered. He is talking about the squaring of the circle, which is one of the three classical problems, along with the doubling of the cube and the trisecting of an angle in ancient Greek mathematics. They are very, very influential in the development of geometry. Today, uh, mathematicians will tell you that you can't square the circle. Partly that's because you have to use an approximation for pi, which is, um, goes on forever. And so you can't square the circle with modern math. But if you allow an infinitesimal bit of slop into it and approximate pi, then you can square the circle. So that's what D is talking about. And I will have a whole video when we are done with this letter and the letter to the printer and all of the theorems talking about the squaring of the circle and what that starts to mean as a, a hermetic concept. Because he's implying that his monad solves this mystery. And there's a, a poem about D um, in the intro to the first English translation of Ripley's Compound of Alchemy that also just says that. It's a, they're viewed as an alchemical transformation. D is, is nothing if not confident. In his last bit here, he makes this comment about Archimedes who never solved the squaring of the circle. He says, here may the toils of Archimedes be compensated for with his most excellent delight, though he never attended the, to this problem. It's enough that the great man had so wished. And there was like poor Archimedes. He didn't attend to this because he never could solve it. But, you know, I did, but Archimedes is still a great guy. Also, this since with the monad glyph, you're flipping things between two, between a, a flat plane and a three-dimensional object, you will, for example, flip a 
uh, a cube in or a square into a cube or a circle into a sphere. So this implicitly reconciles the mystery of how you map things differently in spherical versus Cartesian geometry, which is something of great concern to, for example, math makers, navigators. Um, and these were people in the Muscovy company who often consulted with D. Moving on, number four, he says, with what just and most deserved amazement will the musician be affected when he here perceives the inexplicable celestial harmonies without any motion or sound? That's an allusion, of course, to the harmony of the spheres. And also, I want to just remind you that uh, the number seven is important to musicians also. That is, you have seven notes and then you get to an octave, but the octave repeats what number one was. So you have with an octave a similar idea as a, a mo the monad's relation to a decad. Number five, the astronomer, will he not regret how he has suffered lying awake working under a cold sky when here, without injury to be suffered from the air, he may most exactly observe the peripheries of celestial bodies with his own eyes from under a roof with windows and doors closed at any given time. And here assuredly without the wooden or brass instruments from the art of mechanics. So you're an astronomer. In the middle of winter, you don't have to go outside to look up and see what the Sirius, the star, or Venus as a planet has a morning star, a wandering star. You can just stay in your nice warm house and know about this. But he also does something a bit unusual in Latin here with the peripheries of celestial bodies. Um, that is, you might say orbit, you could orbitas, that's a Latin word, but while he on one level certainly means the revolution of the planets, their orbit, he takes this Latin word, which is from a Greek word, meaning the line around the circle, the circumference of the circle, part of a circle or an arc, instead of using the usual word for either orbit or circumference. So it gives you again, remember he likes this cone of light, so when this cone of light intersects with the earth, the circumference or the periphery is the periphery of a celestial body as reflected light. And of course, when you look up and see one in the heavens, it's the periphery of a celestial body, but you don't need an astrolabe to um, digress upon it. Oh, I was gonna digress here about Baphomet and brazen heads, but I did that in my last video. So we'll go on to optic makers. The optic maker will condemn the stupidity of his training he had worked in all sorts of ways to create a mirror that followed a parabolic line of a conical section with proper circular rotation. His conical sections, by the way, always rotate. So as to expose any flammable material with incredible punishing heat from the sun's rays. You should know that in Latin, uh, parabola can also mean parable. So there is an interesting play on this notion of a, a parabolic line being a parable. Today, we express this in trigonometry with numerals. In Dee's time, they didn't, although one of the first people to do that was the son of one of his friends, uh, the, uh, Thomas Diggs, and actually was a student of Dee's. All right, parabolic mirrors, they capture and focus light. Um, in ancient times, you have descriptions of this where they light something like the Olympic torch in the original Olympics. Dee's going to explore the idea of mirrors and conic sections further in Theorem 16 and, and other places also. But if you want to know about the geometry of burning mirrors in antiquity, here's a citation for you. Um, particularly if you're a grad student interested in D and looking to how you can talk about this subject further. I'm going to continue on the next slide. So he's talked about these mirrors that, and how you can create fire with mirrors by capturing the heat of the sun, sun's rays. But let's look at this next thing. Yet here, out of a triangular section of a tetrahedron, a line is revealed in the form of a circle. First of all, this is, again, playing off that idea of the squaring of the circle if you are making the circle a sphere and the line has already formed a square and it's cubic. So you're trying to reconcile what we now call Cartesian or cubic geometry with spherical geometry. 
Um, a triangular section of a tetrahedron, that's one of the platonic forms. It's the first and most simple one, actually, and it uh, is associated with fire. Um, James Egan, who finds similarities between D's, um, from D's geometry and the geometry of Buckminster Fuller, um, would have a lot to say about this tetrahedron and say Buckminster Fuller's idea of a tetrapump and so on. All right, then D says, this can make a mirror, which even when clouds subdue the sky can reduce any stone or metal into a quasi impalpable powder by the force of truly great heat. Now this sounds like the philosopher's stone, doesn't it? But what he's actually alluding to is something that his hero Roger Bacon did or a pseudo Bacon, okay, because there were a lot of works, particularly in the middle ages, where somebody is writing under the name of someone else. So instead of it being actually by Roger Bacon, it's by a pseudo Bacon. This is not exactly what we would consider today as, as plagiarism. It's the idea that this person takes on the name of Bacon, meaning like they share the ideas of Bacon. You'll even get um, alchemical texts that are like a pseudo Cleopatra. I mean, and they're not written by Cleopatra, but someone presumably who has Cleopatra's alchemical views. Okay, so this one is interesting because it seems like he's talking about the philosopher's stone, the great transmutation, the summum bonum, all of that. Actually, where Roger Bacon or a pseudo Bacon is talking about it and describing it as a philosopher's egg, they're talking about gunpowder. It's the first reference that I know of in the West to gunpowder. Of course, they had it in China already, but it's the first reference in the West. Now, the person who talked about this was uh, an engineer writing back in 1928. So grad student alert, someone ought to look at this and see. It's not something I dug into further. So um, is it gunpowder? Is it the philosopher's stone? Is it both? I would guess both for the same reason that the pseudo bacon calls this the philosopher's egg, though since this is a guess, I could be wrong. Why is that? Because he's writing to Maximilian who is going to be concerned about things like gunpowder. In the same way that Dee's ciphering, which we will get to later in this same video, has great intelligence uses, how to send coded messages. Um, so, D can be sincere in what he is saying about ciphering or a quasi impalpable powder and still make it clear that there is defense uses. All right, continuing on to seven. He who has toiled all the seasons of his life on the subtle investigations of weights. You might consider this like a, a, a subcategory of the engineering of his time the kind of thing that Hero of Alexandria did. How well with his labors and expenses have established himself, when here through a most certain proof, our magisterial monad will show how elemental earth can float above water. What? How can the earth float on top of water? He's of course talking about the classical elements. Air, water, fire, earth. But he is playing on the more usual methods because it's though it, it's the physical world that somebody investigating weights and measures is going to have to deal with. Um, let's go on to the next one here. He says, likewise, those who calculate spaces, again, a kind of uh, sub in category of engineering is those who calculate spaces, both full and in a void, a controversial proof since the beginning of philosophy. What he's referring to here are some philosophers who um, debated the idea of the void in Platonic text. Later, Aristotle is going to outright reject the void. If you're familiar later with some debates at Oxford involving Giordano Bruno, that's one of the things we might suspect they got into. But anyway, he D doesn't um, have, he's not going to get into that argument here. 
he is going to say, likewise, those who calculate space as both full and in a void, a controversial proof since the beginnings of Greek philosophy, have most diligently ventilated them. They have seen that the surfaces of proximate elements are coordinated, connected, and coupled by nearly indestructible bonds of both law and nature from God most high, so that fire, air, and water, three of the classical elements, impelled downward, upwards and downwards, hither and thither, according to the animated will of each, that's coming right from the Timaeus. Most confidently display the most wonderful marvels to people who allow themselves to be guided by various devices quite useful to the Republic, as the entire art of hydraulics demonstrates, as do heroes, Hero of Alexandria, the greatest uh, engineer of, of antiquity, as heroes acts of thaumaturgy as many today would call them. Now, several important things here. He's mentioned three of the classical elements, fire, air, and water. Earth is the fourth. He's not mentioning the ether, the fifth. He will bring the ether in. in it, the ether is, is sometimes hidden, that fifth element corresponding to the dodecahedron. Um, whereas with the others, you have like fire, a tetrahedron, earth, a cube, and so forth. Now, thaumaturgy. Think of it as a work of practical magic. Now, Dee is probably a little touchy about this. When he was a young man, according to Dee anyway, um, he was basically working like doing stage props for a stage performance of a play by Aristophanes piece. And he made this scarab beetle and he rigged up something so that it would fly across the stage. Now you could imagine how to do this, right? Put a, put a, your little fake scarab beetle, uh, hook it to a, a rope, put a pulley up there and you can make it fly across the stage. According to Dee, it got him in a whole lot of trouble. People thought he was doing wicked things and, and magic because the proper understanding of the mechanics of the earth as Hero of Alexandria says, um, and many, many others, like Arthur Clarke, a work of advanced enough technology is indistinguishable from magic. So having said all of that, though, he concludes in a way that does perhaps seem to us like magic. He says, yet no one in that profession today, no engineer today would dare claim that any machine could raise the element of earth upwards through the water and fire. The theories of our monad, however, prove this can be done. How? We'll see when we get to the theorems. Number nine, may you, O most wise king, store this among all the most secret treasures of your mind and memory. I've given you all of my points here um, because you may, this is an incredibly important section and I also have a video below uh, talking about it a bit more. He's coming to the Hebrew Kabbalist, who, when he sees how his Gematria, Notericon, and Tumura, the three preeminent keys of this art, are appointed from and operate outside the limits of that sacred language. All right, what are these three things? You may well know Gematria. Oops, I'm missing an A there, but it's an alphanumeric coder cipher where you get a numerical value from the letters. And there's a, a Latin gematria, Hebrew gematria, Greek gematria. Today we can make an English gematria if we want. The word itself, although it's a Hebrew term, comes from, most people think, the Greek word for geometry. The next one, notericon, you also seem, see used a lot. It's where you substitute a, one letter in for another. Usually this means um, you're shifting the first and last, but you can do it other ways. And the third is Tamura. There's three kinds of that. Now, what I want to point out is down here, and I apologize for the couple typos in this slide. I should have fixed it, but it's a third method used by Kabbalists. That's not as important as what you can do with them. These are great for sending coded messages. D can be all spiritual and sincere about that, and still be letting the king know, hey, these are good ways to send coded messages. At the very end of this class, we're going to look at some ways the hieroglyphic monad can be used for ciphering. And we'll look at um, at least one a letter from D that I take as a coded letter, and we'll look at some of his grids and so forth. Okay, so 
But when he says it's outside the limits of that sacred language, that means you basically can use it to put your mundane message in there. That moreover, the signs and characters of this God-given mystical recovered tradition are brought together from whencesoever, obviously out of everything visible and invisible, and then compelled by truthfulness as he may come to know, will he assuredly acknowledge that this art is here rendered sacred without respect for persons, for our most beloved benevolent God is not only that of the Jews, but of all people. Now, as I've commented over here, that seems very generous. I wish it, it were, but it's actually de protecting themselves. He's not saying we should treat Jewish people equally because in his time, they don't, nor do, you know. So he's protecting himself by saying that their God is also our God, right? That's our Old Testament God. That's the law of the Old Testament. That presages the law of the new. All of that is packed in here. Um, he will also then admit that no mortal may excuse himself ignorant of this, our sacred language. And in our aphorisms to the Parisians, I called this real Kabbalah. All right, pause again. So his aphorisms to the Parisians, which sadly are lost. It would be really cool if they showed up someday. But his aphorisms to the Parisians, most people think, are his mathematical teachings. As a young man, he lectured in Paris at the University of Paris. So his mathematical teachings, he's talking about real Kabbalah. That's kind of interesting. Real Kabbalah, that of reality or being, the Kabbalah of being, as some people call it. And the other common type, grammatical Kabbalah, that which is spoken, which I insist is something writable by man by means of the most well-known letters. Now, the, this exact language, exactly the way D wrote this in the Monus Hieroglyphia is picked up by Athanasius Kircher and dropped into Kircher's um, work. He doesn't say that it's from D, but since it's exactly the same language, D is clearly his source. And I've got a... Uh, a video on that below, or I will a couple days after this post. We could say a whole lot about what he means about the difference between real and spoken Kabbalah, but I'll do it in that other video. Of these, the Kabbalah of the real, the Kabbalah of reality, the Kabbalah of beingness as a creation of natural law, as intimated by Paul, see the other video, is a thing more divine than that of grammar. Since, as connected to the art, it is the inventor of the new and the most faithful explicator of the most abstruse, as others following our example may put to test in other fields. Let's move on to number 10. Number 10, he says, I know well, O king, that you will not shudder if I dare to lay out this magical parable in your royal presence. That word in Latin is parabola, okay? Um, so, it's a lot easier in Latin to have this constant punning back and forth between language, written, speak, spoken language, and a mathematical uh, shape, which is a parabola. But in Latin, old in classical Latin, it just means a comparison or a likeness. By medieval times, it starts to take on the meaning we have now of a, an allegory or a parable. It can also just mean an important speech. So if you want to take this in the simplest possible way, he's just saying, if I dare to lay out this magical speech to you, but he's also drawing on all those other meanings. He says, this, our hieroglyphic monad, possesses a certain latent terrestrial body in the center of its center. Where is that? This little dot right here. And the monad itself teaches without words by what divine power that body should be actuated. Actuated? enlivened, brought to life. He's basically saying this is a golem, if you know what a, uh, a golem is. It will be coupled in perpetual marriage with the gonetic influence of the sun and moon when so actuated. The sun and moon here is the sun and moon of the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. They're joined in marriage. The gonetic influence, that's my made up English word from his main uh, made up Latin word, gonetica, which is a play on gonads or sperm. So the sperm-like influence of the sun and moon, and you see that image in other alchemical texts. So it's not worded that way. It's, it's the idea of the sun and moon coupling and they do the earth with their magic. Okay, the gonetic influence of the sun and moon 
actuate this. And this monad glyph is coupling with the two of them that are coupling. Even if these bodies has, had existed elsewhere most separately before, they will then be in the same place in the sky. On the mo most mundane level, what do you have when the sun and moon are in the same place in the sky? An eclipse. But even if there's not an eclipse, you're going to um, have, be able to capture this power. Now, here by God's will, this doesn't look like something I should digress on, does it? But I'm going to because I'm just perverse in that way. He says this in a real strange way, de nutu. The easiest way in Latin to say God's will would be to say de volantis. Um, there is a, um, an alchemist that I have a whole video on his work below. That's Panteo and his Bor Archidamia. Bor, you know what? I read words. I don't pronounce them well. I know how to pronounce that word, but I'm going to keep going. Bor Archidamia. So Panteo will make a huge deal about De Nutu and the gematria that you get out of it. And from the word Nutu, which is will, but a weird way of saying will, he gets 72, which is very important to him because he doesn't say why. But now we can easily guess why, along with what it is in terms of things up in the sky where a star will process one degree every 72 years or the fact that you can divide 360 degrees by five in a circle of fifths and you get 72. The most important reason is the Shimham Horesh, the 72 names of God in Hebrew in some mystical traditions. So that is Will, new to, is from that same word that I talked about before, nod. So God's will literally in Latin here is God nods. God nods and makes what? The Shemham Faresh, the cosmos, everything else. And then produces this gamea, a word that to the Parisians I interpreted as gamos gaia and the earth of marriage or the terrestrial seal of this conjugal influence. I have another whole video on gamea below, but it's a magical seal. It's a word um, that is a transliteration of the Hebrew word for talisman. Um, should have been clicking over there. And yet he defines this talisman or magical seal as gamos, marriage, you know, hieros gamos, and gaian, the Greek word for earth, as transliterated into Latin and now English, also um, the great uh, primordial goddess, gamos gaian, the terrestrial seal of this conjugal influence, earth of marriage. Again, flashing forward to the Enochian, if you think of um, earth of air, earth of water, earth of fire, even earth of spirit. Now he's going to have earth of marriage. What is this coupling with? The primordial energy of Gaia. He says, when it can no longer be fed and watered in its native earth until the fourth great and truly metaphysical revolution be completed, what does he mean by that? Well, um, my old friend Vincent Bridges would uh, talk about this as corresponding to the four ages within a processional or platonic great year. We see that sometimes um, broken down as you know, the bronze, silver, gold, lead. Um, D was very interested in great world ages. Um, he collected books, for example, from Joachim of Fiori. And there you get the, a theory of ages that is are three overlapping circles. Remember that doctrine of consubstantiality. Um, remember also sometimes in the pages of his spirit, uh, his spirit diaries, he dra draws these three overlapping circles. But that, if you put them out this way, will make four wave-like ages. So in terms of the astronomy and astrology of great world ages, that's what he's talking about. But if you look at his monad, he's doing something else. Um, you have four right angles here. So the metaphysical rotation is how four turns will bring the right angle back to where it was when you started. Okay, um, so this is going to make something invisible. What? A person who is a great magus? Um, a, a religious leader, 
Well, maybe all of those things, but also what's missing. He will at this point give you this picture of his glyph and the center point where the, the first light of creation came in at Fiat Lux is, is now hiding. He's going to go back, going to continue on and tell you here, this point becoming invisible is what he's talking about. Here, O great king, revealed by our monad's theorems, as all magi yet to come will grant, is the truth of the invisibility of the magi, which has been repeated so often and without sin. That is, there are, there are magi among us, but you don't see them. D has no problem with something meaning multiple things at one time. In fact, the more things he can make it mean, it seems, the happier he is. So he's going to go on to D now and talk about the most experienced physician. Even now and out of the same will easily comprehend the mystical disposition of Hippocrates, the great ancient physician. The Hi Hippocratic oath that physicians take today is, you know, you, I will do no harm. And D has written in the margins over here a reference to the um, Book of Breaths or Libra Flatibus that he says is by Hippocrates. Today we know it's probably a, a pseudo Hippocrates by someone else. But D had that book. Um, there's a wonderful collection of all the books we know that were in D's library because his own library list doesn't have a lot of them on there. Um, not just the Sephiroth yet, sir, but I'm thinking of the Codex, Codex Marcianus and so on. So Robertson Watson's book on Dee's library is an excellent resource for anyone who's seriously studying this. Okay. Now, D, I've been saying Dr. D. What kind of a doctor is he? Well, it's an honorary title probably given to him in Prague by Charles University, but he did almost certainly know the works of Paracelsus medicine and Paracelsus and Paracelsus medicine very well. He has books of Paracelsus in his library and his uh, the ideas of contraries that are part of Paracelsian medicine really matches with what he's saying here about what should be added and what should be taken away. And also when Dee was lecturing in Paris with uh, those aphorisms he refers to often, Paracelsian medicine was in vogue in Paris. We're only going to 14 folks, so we're almost there. Hopefully you're still with me. Number 12, the barrel gazer may in his crystal laman most exactly discern all the celestial signs which are handled under the figure of the moon. The Latin word here is barrelisticus, and we could have translated this as a crystal gazer or a scryer, but if we did that, we'd lose the gemstone, and a barrel gazer and its connection to red is going to be important in a minute here. Um, if it seems odd that he's talking about scrying here, remember it, it's a uh, a particular interest, one might even dare say weakness of his, because he says he's not that good at, at, at it. Um, now, one can also say that if he said he was, he could get himself in a lot of trouble, but hence his habit of employing scryers, including Sir Edward Kelly, who sees wonderful things in the crystals that Dee can't see two decades later. Now, when we get down here, we will have red written in Hebrew. So let me read this again. The barrel gazer may in this crystal laman most exactly discern all of the celestial signs which are handled under the figure of the moon, right here, whether in earth or water, and will explore all the regions of air and fire in a carbuncle or red stone. He writes that out in Hebrew, Aleph Dalet Mem. That's the same word for Adam. Um, red would be Edom, but it would be spelled the same way. I've got a whole video below on puns between red and red earth, or kind of ochre colored earth and Adam. And they're not even really puns, it's the same word in Hebrew. So think of that anytime you see D saying red, even if he's not writing it in Hebrew, there's a, can we say Adam there? The red work is another way of saying the great work for the philosopher's stone. So this obviously is going to suggest both a Kabbalistic and an alchemical reading. Now he draws attention to it not only by writing red in Hebrew, but by preceding it with this word, a carbuncle, like uh, usually that's a small glowing piece of coal, 
which uh, just this red burning coal, but it can mean ruby. So the mineral that you get beryl from, I mean, <laughs> ruby, get, uh, rubies are compressed beryl in, in terms of the mineral that's in a ruby. And a ruby is also one of the 12 foundational stones on the breastplate of the Jewish priest that is mentioned in Exodus and Ezekiel, and then again in Reve Revelations. Let's go on to 13. Um, red, Adam, we're going to have the plural of it down here just to give you a flash forward. So 13, and if our hieroglyphic monad's 21st theorem would give satisfaction to a Voarchidamus, we'll have a whole separate video on Voarchidamus below, but it's a play upon the Voarchidumia and Adam and Magus and alluding to that work of Panteos that he annotated so closely. This Voarchidamus is himself a minister speculating upon Voar Bet Aduma. Now Panteo says that this word means gold in Chaldean or a language of the Indian subcontinent. Actually, it, it doesn't, but Panteo says it does. Beth or Bet, the second Hebrew letter, letter which also means house, and Aduma, two reds or two atoms. Hmm. So speculating upon that, he will grant that his peregrinations need not take him to India or the Americas for the sake of philosophizing. Why? Well, supposedly Panteo got this word from India, right? And India is confused in that time with the Indies, which are in what become what we now call the Americas, which were at that time mainly people living their lives until the Europeans and Brits invaded. Anyway, see the associated wordplay video on Red Earth Adam and the associated wordplay video on Voar Chidamas and another one on the Voar Chidumia if you want to take a deep dive into this section. This, as I said, is the most dense wordplay in this part of the letter. And next, D continues, we have written on the origin of adeptship. Whatever the art of Ariaton may promise or provide, or that I have gleaned in my 20 years of great hermetic labors. All right, I've studied D for almost 20 years now, more than, well, actually for 20 years. So there's my great hermetic labors. I've worked on this since 2007. And so I can tell you what he means by Ariaton and why. But this isn't a, you heard it here first. I actually got this from C.H. Austin, who uh, wrote about this in 1964 in his translation. Ariaton is almost certainly a play on the Latin genitive form of Aries, the sign Aries, which is what he has down here. Aries is associated with fire, so it's going to be firing alchemically everything above it. So the reason Yostin thinks this, and I agree with him, is because we know there is a word in Latin, deltaton, which is borrowed from deltaton in Greek, which means the shape of the letter delta. That's the letter delta, the Latin word for the triangle chorus constellation, because delta is a triangle. However, delta is also how you would write the D in D. And later in D's spirit diaries, he writes a delta for himself for D. So certainly given all the Greek and Latin he is reading, he knows about deltaton. So it makes sense that he would have a similar play on Ariaton, and now it means the shape of Aries. The art of Ariaton may promise or provide, and now it's referring to the Aries in his hieroglyphic monad. Um, and as I've already said, it's at the base of the glyph, and so it alchemically fires all the shapes above it. He says, this is an illustrated anagogical apodixis. Well, here he's just being a, a bit snobby, which D can be sometimes. Apodixis is a, an ancient Greek word transliterated into Latin and now English, which is the rhetorical support for a proposition that is common knowledge. This, even in D's era, this is, is what he's saying is not common knowledge. This is D's great work. He's the first one who has said these things. But it's sort of the same line of thought that when he writes his 200 aphorisms that are the Propoitamata Aphoristica, that title translates into foundational teachings, meaning like the stuff you need to know before you learn anything else, except everyone doesn't know it. It's D that knows it. Um, all right. So this 
is an illustrated anagogical apodixis. Nevertheless, we assure your royal majesty that everything is so clearly expressed in this our analogous hieroglyphic monad work that no other similar, similar example could be accordingly pressed out and put on display before mankind. Pressed out again like a magical seal. Everything, this is John Dee's theory of everything as my co-translator Nancy Turner is fond of saying. Oh, and we have another slide where I put everything in gold just so I could say that. Oh, this is the same slide, sorry about that. Congratulations, you have just finished the most complicated and packed part of Dee's letter to Maximilian. I cannot tell you how much of my time I have spent going through figuring this out so you don't have to. If you understood this, you will have no difficulty understanding everything that is to come. In fact, from here on, you're gonna find it easy. Even the 22nd theorem that um, a lot of people have trouble with and don't understand, you're gonna find it easy. And if you wanna take a really deep dive, like I said, there is added videos below explaining um, more about some of these things I've talked about. But that's it for this class. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.